this should be it from my side now. So I'll hand over to Jan Stolzenbach, who is head of strategy and operations at SMPC, and Natalia Amanis, who is consultant at SMPC. And they will tell us today something about uh, the topic from idea to implemented uh, reality, design of communication strategies, and agenda setting towards politicians and institutional stakeholders. And I'm, I'm very looking forward to it. So dear Julian, dear Natalia, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Annika, and welcome everyone. Um, so yeah, it's a great opportunity speaking to you. Um, some might still know us from, from the last bootcamp, Deutschland 4.0, a more German initiative, but now truly a European one. So I'm I'm actually in Crete, Greece right now. So I, I said like, okay, let's make this a European presentation. So I moved uh, away from, from Germany. Um, so, but I hope the connection will be stable enough. And it's um, it's a great challenge uh, Ekipa and uh, our host here, Annika, have put together. So we aim to provide some input during the next 60-ish minutes, um, <laughs> not in Calimera. And um, uh, the, the goal is really to also provide uh, input for the next phase the teams are experiencing or, or heading towards um, ahead of the, of the final presentation in about two months. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what we are here for today. So myself, as Annika just said, um, head of strategy and operations with SMPC, a boutique uh, consulting company focusing on um, yeah, political and policy advice consulting, mainly in Berlin, but, but also across Europe and for international clients. And here was my great colleague, um, Natalia, who is, is mainly doing uh, projects in the healthcare sector, uh, but also other international um, clients uh, across uh, different different topics. Um, again, today's session is about providing you input. So please, as Annika said, don't be shy to interrupt at any time if you want to dive into a specific topic in more depth or just ask your questions uh, because you're interested or because you think it could be helpful for the next phase of your project and in preparing for the final presentation, where among other things, um, there will be some politicians uh, looking at the presentations and the pitches. Um, and uh, yeah, we want to make sure that you have all the information to be prepared for, for that. Um, our pre presentation, um, and if you, if you go to the next slide or even the next one, this one, yes. Um, is, is basically structured in, in three main parts. So first of all, understanding the situation we are in. That's just important for also you as, as a team, understand the, the environment uh, you are in currently um, from, a, from political, from, from economic, but also from a societal uh, perspective. Um, and then we would like to really dive more into the topic of stakeholder uh, understanding um, and also how networks um, play a key role and how to understand them and how to actually utilize them. We have some, we think, interesting use cases, um, one from the healthcare sector, one from the um, aviation sector. Um, project we are currently working on and, and just to give you some flavor how we address political stakeholders and how we analyze actually the, the environment. And last but not least, we have some tips and tricks for you to take away um, into the next phase and also into the, the sessions you have with, with the guys from Bechtle, but also your company coaches um, to, as I said before, uh, prepare for the next um, phase. Um, the situation we are in, um, quite quite interesting currently, of course, we all know we are still in a, in a pandemic, in the COVID-19 pandemic, which is now around for over one and a half years. So it's actually heavy and long and, and depending on where you're currently, you're either facing some, uh, some restrictions being lifted or new ones being imposed because uh, this is just a fluid uh, situation we are in and, and countries adjusting to it on a, on a daily basis. Um, but of course, this has affected all our lives in many different ways. If you are a mother, uh, you have children and you do homeschooling, but still uh, home office, uh, this might be a big challenge for you. Um, if you are trying to work from, from abroad or you, you have clients abroad, you want to travel, that's, that's mainly not possible. So it's still not possible to travel to the US from Europe um, uh, unless you have a, a sec exemption. Um, but also, of course, if you're a company, if you're um, a shop or you are a restaurant, you are desperately looking to start your business again, um, among, uh, despite all the restrictions that there might be in place. But on the other hand, people might be reluctant to travel 
or to actually go to the next restaurant or to the cinema. So it's just um, a very, very strange situation. And the biggest crisis I have been in, to be honest, um, um, and, and I think that's true for many uh, others as well. On the other hand, businesses have adjusted. So big companies like Vodafone, they basically announced that they will in Germany just do pure 100% home office going forward. Um, of course, uh, spending less money on office rent, but also providing more flexibility to their employees in terms of how they want to work and from where they want to work, um, which is, is interesting, especially for a country like Germany, where um, we are more used to a nine to five um, say mentality where you spend really time at the office and, and if you're not in the office and then, then it's also not not uh, you don't work at that time then on a, on a global level we, we definitely see also a change in in politics from from major countries like uh, the us and, and china um, especially under the last four years um, or during the last four years uh, under president trump um, i considered a, a very interesting time um, he addressed many uh, topics quite quite directly um, but he addressed them um, especially the trade deficit between the us and europe but also between china and uh, us china of course over the last 20 years has emerged from a emerging country to a, to a full industrial nation that has uh, that wants to have a sit uh, sorry a seat at the table, um, and in between we have the European Union uh, that wants to also with with over 600 million in, in people it represents wants to um, play a key role and, and needs to keep play a key role because if you take climate change for example that uh, their European Union is really the driver. Um, the US have understood under the new president uh, Biden who is also um, say still following similar goals, but but with a more uh, polite attitude, I would call it. Um, but they have understood climate change; they need to work on this as well. But of course, they have other business interest um, in in this in states um, than we have in the EU. And and China is, is still an emerging country, is still heavily relying on coal plants uh, to produce energy um, for for their companies and 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 just for the people. So um, on, a, on a global level, it's interesting to see, uh, but it's also a challenge for companies that want to do business, um, how the power is, is shifting um, and how power plays are being played out uh, currently. And just take an example like Adidas, um, who is, is just in a, um, yeah, in a strange situation because from uh, say ESG perspective, they actually would need to pull out um, any kind of production line out of um, China because of what's going on in, in different regions of China. Um, and, and on the other hand, they are threatened to not be able to sell any products in China. So same with Hong Kong. If you speak up there, you are just uh, in the risk of not doing any business anymore uh, with, again, to ESG standards should be um, a no-brainer for a company but it's it's not that simple and not that easy we'll come to that in a second again when we talk about stakeholder and shareholder value and then yeah on the right hand side we have the topic of climate change um, just germany has has been hit la heavy last week and, and it's probably being hit again uh the next two days from heavy flooding which uh, is, is a direct um uh, directly related to climate change and this is also something um involving or not involving us but uh, affecting us on on many different areas so of course first of all there's the weather and there's the heavy flooding on the other hand germany has, has said they want to go out of nuclear energy and also uh, stop any kind of coal plants for electricity um, production this is of course the right way on the other hand this needs to be uh, paid for and it's it's being paid for by the taxpayers similar to other countries as well um and and this also puts a pressure on the on the society uh, because they pay the price in the end and they on this kind of pass they they need to um understand what's happening and why it's happening and where it's actually leading to um, and events like that happened last week of course um, bring up a lot of questions from from society from people um, no matter what background no matter what profession um, and they want to understand what's happening and how this can actually be uh, solved so it's it's a big ask for politicians all these three topics you see here and that's of course just a, a very short overview um, is, is something politicians are uh, heavily involved and need to say play the cards right thank you natalia um so 
as mentioned before, COVID is affecting all our lives. Um, but what can we do to avoid these kind of things? Um, on the left hand side, uh, again, examples that really affect uh, many different stakeholder groups, the US, I, I briefly touched on that already. Um, but Brexit, for example, that happened, if I'm not mistaken, in 2016, so five years ago, um, the UK decided to leave um, the European Union and, and uh, as of end of last year, this actually happened. So for, um, What's important or what we want to point out here is it things happen five years ago, but still have an effect on, on us, on companies, on society today. So the, the Brexit is, is kind of a done deal, but it's actually not because the Northern Ireland Protocol is still um, a big burden on the future relationship between the EU and um, the Brexit. Um, on the other hand, the EU itself must uh, evolve further and must uh, strengthen uh, its inner core, um, maybe even take on new members um, like Albania or, or others. And uh, this is, of course, something also to, to keep in mind that there are things going on um, since many years that uh, still affect different kind of stakeholder groups. And for Germany, um, quite interesting, we are in a so-called super election year. So we have a number of state uh, elections um, and we have a big federal election coming up in September. Not just this, but uh, we also have a new chancellor after 16 years of Chancellor Merkel. So quite stable uh, government you could consider uh, compared to other countries in Europe and especially globally here in Germany. Um, but with, with the new chancellor, we would not only see probably a completely different agenda, even if, if he or she is from the same party, um, hint, it would be a he. Um, but um, with the likelihood to have a greener, uh, or not a greener, but have the Green Party being part of the government in Germany, um, we would also see a completely different agenda, a greener agenda and, and definitely um, a greener approach in policy making. So we are looking in Germany as at uh, probably four to eight year cycle, which will look completely different um, to the last 16 years under Chancellor Merkel. And this provides, of course, opportunities for, for startups and teams like, like we are presenting to today, but also um, provides risk uh, in, in terms of, okay, how will things change and, and how can I, I, as a person, as society or as a company, adjust to what's coming uh, ahead. And uh, COVID, of course, is also impacting us. On the right-hand side, really briefly, you can see how these kind of things are connected to each other, startups, economy, politics, uh, but of course also science, quite important, um, and how topics like um, the EU strategy the Green Deal, but also the, the SDGs from the United Nations are affecting all these. And um, say the federal election might um, impact politics in the economy more in the first instance, but then um, as, a, as a second um, step, uh, it will also impact startups um, and of course civil, civil society. Um, and that's just something to keep in mind. If we move on, then we see that um, that also over the past years, um, and that's actually quite connected to the SDGs, um, the, and based on, on an initiative by BlackRock, um, I'll come to that in a second, um, the, the approach how we actually consider what's, what's valuable has significantly changed. So over the, the past 50, 60 years, it was always about the shareholder value. So how can I maximum the profit for my shareholders? Um, if I'm a company listed in a stock exchange, it's really just about how to increase uh, the share price. And this has um, this has changed over the past years. Why has this happened? Because um, first of all, the, the loss of trust in businesses um, as, as, um, um, as uh, researched by Edelman Trust. Um, so that's something I recommend everyone looks up, Edelman Trust report. It's an annual survey um, where they measure the trust in businesses, in politics, um, and in other institutions um, across the globe. And this has significantly changed over the past year. So consider we are especially in Europe, in a quite stable environment, considering that there are no major conflicts and economy has been, uh, grew a lot since the 08 crisis, but still the trust has decreased significantly. Um, on the other hand, 
um, there's clear ask for organizations to create value for society. So not just for the shareholder, but for the stakeholder. Stakeholder means uh, could be a person, could be an employee, could be a client, could be even the client's uh, children. Um, and um, all this, so sustainability, economy, GDP, opportunity, solidarity, all this needs to be considered, not just the pure economic um, benefit. And that's also, of course, something where the SDGs come, come into play. Um, as mentioned, this initiative was um, started by BlackRock. And um, BlackRock, as um, a few might not know, is one of the largest investment um, companies globally. So they are basically invested in, in pretty much every company which is out there. And this, of course, gives them some uh, leverage to implement their agenda um, and make sure that uh, their strategy is, is yeah, yeah, um, heard um, or listened to and um, considered. Um, other companies then jumped on, on this kind of trend and said, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's true and it, it's important to consider the uh, stakeholder value over the shareholder value. So considering all the environment, um, considering all the stakeholders that could be affected by uh, someone's products. You see companies here um, like biopharmaceuticals um, or take uh, GM General Motors that, that of course, um, are also considered negative uh, in some negative uh, in some of the uh, some of the business they are doing. So, biopharmaceuticals, for example, they purchased Monsanto uh, with this one um, uh, product, which is considered to be led to um, to cancer. So, of course, again, this is just important for companies like Bayer to consider the product they are currently bringing to market to make sure it's not hurting everyone, not the environment, not the stakeholders, not now, not in the long run. Um, and as a result, as you can see on the right hand side, it's really about investing in, in employees, environment protection and fair and ethical dealings with suppliers. Uh, suppliers. Um, fair and ethical dealings, of course, are very important for us in Europe because most of the products we uh, let uh, produce overseas, so meaning especially in Asia, are produced under, say, not so good uh, circumstances. And that's something where the EU just passed a law. Um, in our consideration, not, not uh, strong enough, but um, actually um, at least we have the law now that companies are responsible for their uh, supplier uh, connections and uh, so supply chain actually and, and the circumstances under which products are being produced. Uh, and that's important because we cannot just look at Europe, but we need to look at the whole world if we want to change something, uh, not just for climate change, but also for how we do business um, and, and stakeholder value means uh, we also consider the stakeholders that produce our, our products, uh, for example, in Asia. Uh, there's, of course, a challenge. Um, and to be honest, the only leverage you have to really implement this is the money. Let's face it. Uh, money makes the world go round, I think the, the saying is. And that's just true. So it's not just BlackRock, but also the EU with the Green Deal started to heavily invest into the industries they think are going to be important in the future um, and with this it also means that it's for say if you're in a business say uh, nuclear energy which is considered not to be a future um, energy um, producing method it means that it's also harder for you to obtain finance so it's the eu it's a it's a connected banks that also make it more difficult to get finance for things that are uh, not considered uh, green part of the green deal on the other hand it's easier to get financing for initiatives that actually support the eu green deal or other initiatives like um, the SDGs also um, support and that's that's good for you for the initiatives we are talking about here today uh, the different use cases because these are about uh, providing a better and, and greener future for for all of us so it's easier to for investors also to get a return on their investment in, if they invest into future um, uh, topics rather than into topics that are considered the past um, so yeah over we are actually in the process where the shareholder value is being replaced um, and where companies also with the annual report and during their annual meetings with shareholders are um, uh, providing reports on, on all aspects we've just provided to you and not just the po um, pure shareholder price. 
So thank you, Jan. Now we are in the second part of um, our session. So now we are going to talk a bit about communication strategy, uh, strategies uh, for political positioning. Um, and also we will show you a couple of practical examples. So um, since it, it was clear, uh, so since the politics strongly affect business, so it is um, in their best interest to stay informed about the political and social agenda. And my colleague Julian just showed that. So more than that, business can and um, is actually already involved in solving issues of inclusion, um, sustainability, innovation and other social topics. So these two institutions, um, the business, and the politics um, can give each other what each of them lacks. So business can give, for instance, uh, more efficiency, innovative technologies um, or technical solutions, more pragmatism and targeted solutions. So in its turn, politics, a good politics, I would say, uh, can be a guarantee that business acts in a social responsible manner. So such corporations uh, build kind of check and balances system, of course, it, if it works good. So where society can, of course, enjoy the benefits. It's essential, hence, to be the collaborative relation instead of confrontation. So hence, the strategic communication and political positioning plays a vital role in generating common social goals and solving um, global challenges. So, um, as I just said, so the, the developing of uh, political communication um, is a complicated process and um, it's a multi-stage process. So we start with the development of political, um, uh, of strategic positioning, um, of the product and its strategic position of the product. And then we analyze the agenda and um, examine our solution or our technologies to find out which social topics need to be addressed and can be addressed in alignment with our solution or with our innovation. Then we talk with the stakeholders. We have to define the most important um, decision makers um, and stakeholders, we organize events, we talk about the topic, we provide the solution, we provide the innovation, uh, even, um, and we take, in, in, in this case, so we take then an active part in giving response to the challenges from the political and social agenda. Um, here's once again a practical framework. Um, how to develop a communication strategy and how to make a good political positioning. So we start with uh, political and social framework and uh, by answering the question, what are political social relevances? And uh, we understand the needs, we try to understand the needs and um, technological and social trends. We try to align um, the innovative solution with the political and social agenda then we go to this next next stage we have of course to define who are the uh, decision makers and who are the stakeholders we answer these questions and then we move forward we see now more than just technical innovative solution but rather we answer the question, why do we do that? Creating with that the value story with a new focus. But it's not just the technical solution. We do that because we want to contribute toward better life in our society, making this society more sustainable. So on the last stage, we implement our new value story, new focus, and we implement our strategy by uh, creating events, talking about the topic, uh, make broad media attention, um, 
So this is um, kind of framework. Um, and now I would like to tell you about one um, practical example. Um, so there is a lot of information about lucrative pharma industry with high salaries and judgments that pharma makes money out of our health. Um, and for the government and state health insurance, pharma is first of all cost factor. But pharma and biotechnology industry is at the same time, are at the same time elite industry in terms of innovations. So they can do, they can and they do provide a solution for a better medicine. The pandemic has shown us how pharmaceutical companies can also contribute to solving the problems of public health um, a pandemic. So we saw, uh, we've seen uh, the rapid development of vaccine in one year. This process normally takes more than 10 years or at least 10 years. So it must be seen not just a cost factor, it must be seen not just as a creative industry, but um, there is something missed in the agenda, else in political agenda, that pharma is actually an innovation driver. And thanks to these innovations, we can enjoy antibiotics, insulin, personalized medicine, and advanced therapies for rare diseases, and finally vaccines. So pharma companies are hence a vital cooperation partner to solve global challenges via their innovations. So it's not just um, technical solution or innovation, it's much more. It's the solution of a global pandemic in this case. So they can take an active part by implementing the global agenda to make healthcare more inclusive, safe, and innovative. Um, so our first practical use case is about engagement use case is about engagement of pharma company by supporting patient advocates. As a result of close cooperation between practical doctors, university medicine, um, pharma company and patient advocates. So they were working together and elaborated and published a so-called white paper. Um, it's nice. I think I haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah. So, so they called, uh, they published a um, position paper, white paper, implications of pandemic from the perspective um, of patients, doctors, nursing professionals, and scientists. So, um, let's see how it might be aligned with the global and uh, European agenda. So, if we take a closer eye on the on the global agenda so we see that actually the all the issues that were raised in this white paper from uh, from the scientists from the patient advocates and from the doctors they are all already in the global patient safety action plan uh, and those goals that were set in the white paper they are aligning with the goals of World Health Organization in, and in their um, um, in their uh, action plan for 2021, 2030. And then uh, I found really a great citate in this uh, position paper of the World Health Organization that patient engagement and empowerment is perhaps the most powerful tool to improve to improve patient safety. So what does pharma company? They take an, an active part to implement this and um, to improve the safety and innovative um, health for not just not just um, in developed countries or not just on a national level, but addressing also the uh, global agenda. So this is um, um, it's great that they published and they elaborated, they um, did a great job, but along publishing won't help to communicate this topic broader. Uh, uh, no. So what do we do? Um, we need to talk about the results. So we need to use the windows of opportunities. And here you can see an example, a small example of how 
we can uh, how we can uh, multiplicate the social impact um, of what we've done. So we talk with the stakeholders, we define the decision makers. We use the windows of opportunities. Here is an example, um, the presentation of white paper to the governing mayor of Berlin. Um, so what we've done with that, we delivered content, content inputs for social and political agenda. We, we uh, multipli multiplicated the social impact and we improved the visibility of uh, the topic which correlates and aligns with the global agenda. So this is a contribution that may be, may be done by uh, pharmaceutical companies which shows that they are more responsible and they are not just a cost factor, but they are a partner, cooperation partner. Thank you, Julian. This is it. Thank you, Natalia. Before I dive into the second uh, use case, and, and because this is just in a completely different one than you just presented, I think it's important. And as you just pointed out with your last slide, uh, with governing mayor of Berlin, um, politicians and other stakeholders, they really rely on, on new ideas, on innovative ideas that they can actually support or also leverage in their daily work because in the end politicians, uh, members of parliament, members of EU parliament, uh, members of state parliaments or whatsoever, they rely on, on fresh and new ideas to understand what actually moves society and, and how what needs to be addressed uh, to make sure our society becomes better, more resilient, you mentioned that. Um, and, and so don't be don't be shy and I come back to that in, in, in about in a couple of seconds or slides, but don't be shy, shy to present your ideas to stakeholders and ask for support or for input or um, or ask for them to consider this when, when doing policy making um, or, or other kind of things in terms of their daily daily business because politicians represent uh, society so it's their task to understand what's going on and how to um, actually support the agenda uh, of, of different uh, people um, across the country or in our case across the European Union. Um, the second use case is about hydrogen aviation, uh, quite interesting uh, also in the current context um, because um, not just uh, since COVID uh, but even before there was uh, some flight uh, well, shame uh, going on, um, of course, uh, taking a, a low budget flight um, from, I don't know, UK to Mallorca to the Baleas for 50 euro um, is, is just something, or British pound in that case, is something considered uh, not good for our, for our environment. Of course, the biggest um, producer is, uh, is the car traffic, but uh, per person uh, CO2 emissions is in aviation just, just uh, uh, abnormal high uh, and that's something we as a society globally need to address. It's again one topic where certain countries and uh, or the European Union will move ahead but uh, others will need to, to follow suit. Um, not so much because um, they cannot afford to keep the uh, the fuel flying going but again due to the financing and other regulations that will be put into place uh, the EU, for example, could easily at some point say, like, you can only fly to an airport within the European Union if you at least use um, sustainable aviation fuel or uh, you at least are doing a 50-50 in terms of electricity and, and normal jet fuel. Uh, and this, of course, would mean for every um, airline that wants to do business in Europe, so for example flying from Dubai, from the US into Europe, they would need to adhere to these kind of rules. Of course this needs to be a position political, but it just means it's possible to change uh, on a scale larger than just the EU if you are um, making sure that the regulations and other boundaries are in place to support. In this example here, uh, we are working with a company that is actually actively producing um, a six-seater plane uh, with hydrogen aviation, uh, sorry, hydrogen uh, fuel uh, for aviation. Um, six-seater, of course, means uh, you, ca you cannot move um, many people, but that's just the first step. So they are looking to greatly uh, increase the number of, of seats on, on the planes or the 
types of planes uh, to 50 and then subsequently to 100 to 150 um, seats. And that's actually something then that becomes quite interesting because that's an amount that means you can do national and regional um, flying with uh, hydrogen fuels, fuels or maybe at some point um, really CO2 emission free. And that's then something that would really boost um, other things as well. So it's not so much about the, it definitely is about how much CO2 emissions you can save for this um, particular area or industry. But it also means that at some point technology and innovation will move on to other industries. So, for example, auto uh, um, car makers, um, automotives, um, maybe, but also others. So, um, ship transport and these kind of things, where again, also we have uh, high pollutions due to um, the amount of traffic and the the engines that are currently being used, and. Um, it's an interesting topic because um, it is happening in an environment that's shifting, not on a daily basis, but but you could at least say on a monthly basis. So you need to adjust and see what's going on, which uh, political party is, is uh, pushing this topic, uh, which politician is actually pushing this topic, could be a supporter, what kind of financial support could be um, provided through institutions, through the parliament, or even through the EU to make this not just a dream, but a reality uh, that can uh, that has available business case behind, because that's, I guess, quite important also for the ideas um, part of Innovate 2030. In the end, you need to have a business case that fits today, but also fits in this uh, changing environment we are in and, and in this expected, uh, as I mentioned earlier, radical shift uh, in policy making over the next um, approximately 10 years. So um, this is important here for this use case as well. Um, and challenges, of course, are you're fighting against the big guys, uh, Airbus and um, Boeing, among others. China is just in the in the process of um, kind of creating a national champion in uh, plane production. So that means their market, the market share of Airbus and uh, Boeing, will significantly decrease in China over the next. 10, 15, 20 years, because they have their own planes. Um, um, definitely no sustainable aviation fuel in place. Um, but again, there are ways on the political level, and that's where stakeholders need to be involved and need to become supporter of, of these great ideas we have in Europe, um, we have here in Innovate 2030, um, to make sure these uh, topics and ideas have the right um, regulation in place to, to boost them and to make the business case a reality. On the next slide, just um, highlighting what kind of topics are addressed with this particular project. It's definitely environment. Uh, it's for sure economic and uh, also technology and innovation, where again in Europe, um, we are in a quite, say, good stage. But on the other hand, you always need to fight and, and keep going, uh, keep innovating to, to stay on top. Um, the good thing is, again, uh, money is really flowing into these kind of areas. Um, and, and that's, of course, needed. Um, it's it's uh, provided directly to startups. It's done through science organizations who support, uh, like like Fraunhofer uh, and others. Um, but it also is provided through, for example, tax benefits or other things. And most importantly, it's about society. So the impact these ideas can have on the society to, for example, avoid flooding. To uh, and, and and our CO2 emissions, uh, the result is the flooding we just saw in, in Europe and we see elsewhere, all the heavy uh, forest fires we see in the United States and the horrible forest fires we saw in Australia, I believe, two or three years ago. Um, lastly, uh, and that's quite important, and that's also a, a big recommendation for all the teams of Innovate 2030, we need to um, not just stay on the slide, please, um, is the value story. Two slides back, Natalia. Um, so it's really about you to define a value story uh, that addresses the different stakeholders you have identified for you. So kind of a target map, who are the stakeholders relevant for you and uh, that you a, a need to address or B that need to become a supporter to further push your topic. Um, and this va the value story is really the, the core um, of your messaging and of um, of your of your topic of your idea, um, this value story delivers uh, the emotion and the, the the content towards the stakeholders and make sure they understand what uh, what you're trying to achieve, but also why it's such an important topic and needs to be pushed uh, all along the way. So, big recommendation to really 
uh, define your value story and make sure uh, it's, uh, it's it's consistent but it also addresses not just this SDG but the bigger bigger political agenda going on in Europe but also on a global uh, global stage just just don't focus on the SDG purely but uh, take other things going on in this world into consideration as well now moving on to the concluding remarks Natalia um, a big thing also to understand, and here we have a couple of German uh, politicians selected, um, understand the stakeholders and the situation they are in. So it's not just a bit you as a starter boy, uh, as a team to have some ideas. Uh, it's about the people you're addressing and, and the situation they are in. So that's important to understand. Understand the person that's in front of you. Um, let's take the person in the middle, um, Armin Laschet. He's currently the uh, governor of Northern Westphalia, so a state in Germany, but more importantly, he's a, he's a candidate for chancellor following Merkel uh, in September for the Christian Democratic Union. Um, so although currently in a role as governor, he's of course preparing for the role as a chancellor. Um, and this means, first of all, someone else be, will become the governor of Northern uh, Westphalia, NRW, um, but also the Laschet will be in charge basically um, and running the government. So he will nominate the ministers, he will decide the different budgets the ministries have, and he will set the big uh, agenda topics, of course, together with a coalition partner, probably from the Green Party uh, for the next four, four years. Um, and that's, again, something that will be different than the last 16 years, um, different than the last four years. Uh, and, and different than the last two years. So um, it's, it's important to understand also that he is quite deep in uh, in the relationship with France. Uh, this is good in terms of innovation, as we do a lot of innovation projects with, with French companies in Germany. It also is a challenge um, as both France and Germany are facing quite an upswing of right-wing uh, politicians. So that's, that's a challenge and, and, and quite difficult. But also it's a challenge because the Indus, Germany and both trends are heavily focused on, um, uh, I would call it old school industry. So both countries uh, need to undergo a radical shift over the next years also in terms of how the industry is set up. Um, unions have, have a quite strong say uh, in these countries, in, in France more than in Germany. But also this leads uh, to potential conflicts if you, for example, want to push um, climate change. Uh, but uh, this will mean that uh, potential job losses um, or um, salary cuts uh, will happen in, in certain industries. And you need to fight against the unions uh, who are sometimes more about keeping the status quo than, than really moving moving into the next day chapter. Um, and uh, on the, light -hand, the left hand side, just to mention one another, one other person, uh, Dorothy Baer, she's currently a minister for digitalization in Germany. Um, but is is from her from the job she's done so far, and uh, from how the party is set up in Bavaria, so that's the sister party of the CDU, is the CSU, um, is is in a good position to become either minister or potentially the next governor of of Bavaria. So um, she was actually the patron uh, person for Deutschland 4.0, and um, is is yeah he, she's just preparing herself for the next big, uh, say, position. And if you address such a person, or call, again, think about her agenda and what's important for her for the next six to 12 months and how you could support this um, or how you could play a role in this. And um, this then, again, uh, provides you ample opportunities to discuss this with her. If we go to the next slide. Um, just what, what's what's important for the project in the next phase. Um, we just put together a couple of recommendations. What does the startup add to society? I think we mentioned that at length uh, during the presentation. But again, um, make sure you understand um, the impact your idea could have on society in different areas. Uh, again, coming to the value story and the emotional aspects also you need to consider. Um, then really, what's your stakeholder map? Um, and is this an influencer? Is this a decision maker? Is it a co-decision maker? Really understand the, the important stakeholder, really pre pretty much draw a map or a mind map 
and uh, understand how and when and where you could actually address different kind of stakeholders and what could they add to your uh, startup idea. Is it financing? Is it input? Is it support? Could they really open a couple of doors for you? That's important to understand. Um, of course, which challenge are you addressing is important. Again, ref um, relates also to the value story. And then also understand how you yourself would position uh, towards politicians, other institutional stakeholders, um, but not just you, but also understand their situation they are currently in and what they might be aiming for and how you could create a win-win situation for uh, both parties. And that's, of course, just in a nutshell. Uh, if you dive more into this, and, and I'm sure the company coaches will help with that and, and the other coaches, um, but also Natalia and myself will also be in the um, lobby, I guess, uh, answering uh, or be able to answer more questions if you want to dive into this more. But with that, we come to the last slide. And this means we say thank you for your um, patience, first of all, and for, for listening to us. Um, it's it's quite an interesting topic, and for some, it's just some uh, a compute black box. Uh, we have so, we are so fortunate to work in this area on a daily basis, but sometimes it can be uh, it can be difficult, um, especially as you could see in the beginning. Um, we are just living in a in a world that's constantly changing um, now more than ever, and uh, to to position itself oneself in this environment is uh, can be tricky. But on the other hand, politicians are also just humans. Um, again, they are looking for good ideas they can push uh, or they can put on their agenda, not just for their own benefit, because but because it benefits uh, society, uh, environment, and just uh, our country, our European Union as a whole. Um, and so, don't be don't be shy, don't be afraid to really present your ideas to, in your mind, coming back to the stakeholder map, to the right stakeholders. And um, yeah, best of luck with uh, with today, but also with with your ideas. And uh, I can't wait to join the the final event and look uh, look at all the great presentations and uh, see what will happen with them afterwards, um, and and who will be a successful startup going forward. So thank you so much, uh, also on behalf of Natalia, and uh, we are. Now opening up, um, Annika, I guess you will join us again. Again, there you are, perfect timing for uh, questions or comments.